According to the New England Journal of Medicine, each day 12 children die from gun violence in America. Another 32 are shot and injured. Guns are the leading cause of death among American children and teens. One out of 10 gun deaths are age 19 or younger. Firearm deaths occur at a rate more than five times higher than drownings. The United States has had 2,032 school shootings since 1970, and these numbers are increasing rapidly. Alarmingly, 948 school shootings have taken place since the tragedy at Sandy Hook Elementary School in December 2012 almost 10 years ago. School shootings have returned to pre-COVID levels and by some accounts have even increased. However, the US Department of Homeland Security research shows that if we know the signs of gun violence, we can prevent it and reverse the trend. Since the historic attack, attack at Columbine High School in 1999, nearly 300,000 American students have been on campus during a school shooting. Today here at Vanderbilt with the project on unity and American democracy, we are going to discuss all of this and how we navigate the gun debate in America today. Please join me in welcoming our expert academic panel. We have with us today, Dr. Jonathan Metzl, who holds the Frederick Ben Rensler Chair and is Professor of Medicine, Health and Society, Professor of Sociology and a Professor of Psychiatry. Dr. Metzl is the Director of the Department of Medicine, Health and Society and a renowned expert on gun violence and mental illness. He has recently appeared on ABC, MSNBC, C-SPAN and many other national media outlets discussing gun violence in America today. We also have with us Professor Jim Blunstein, who is the University Professor of Constitutional Law and Health Law and Policy at Vanderbilt, Professor of Management at Owen Graduate School of Management, and Director of the Vanderbilt Health Policy Center. Professor Blumstein is also a nationally renowned and published scholar of health, law, and medicine and voting rights. We have with us as well um, Professor Sophie Bjork James. Um, who is an assistant professor of anthropology, and her specializations include race, racism, and hate crimes. Her work has appeared on NBC, NBC Nightly News, NPR's All Thing Considered, BBC Radio 4's Today, and in the New York Times. And we have with us from Duke University, Professor Joseph Bloker, who is a professor of law at Duke University and the co-director of the Duke Center for Firearms Law. Bloker's principal academic interests include federal and state constitutional law, the First and Second Amendments, and legal history and property, and he has published a wide range of academic articles on these topics. He has spoken before Congress and written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, Slate, and Vox, just to name a few. So we will get started with this first question for all of you, and we'll start with Dr. Metzl. In a democracy, we think a lot about responsibility and accountability. So let us begin here with this fundamental question. Whose responsibility is it in America today to fix our gun violence problem? Well, thank you very much. Um, and I'm really honored to be here and I'm so glad we are having this conversation at Vanderbilt and hopefully this is the beginning of many such conversations about this pressing, uh, this pressing issue. Um, certainly, I think the automatic response, I would say, is in a participatory pluralistic democracy, it should be everybody's responsibility. I think that we've fallen into a divide um, right now of, of paradigms, really, that's my sense of it now, of kind of a paradigm on one hand that is a public health paradigm, um, looking at regu regulations and and, and impact on safety and using things like gun injury and death statistics on one hand, and a paradigm of freedom and liberty and of kind of 
um, you know, more constitutional framework. And I think the minute that those frameworks are at odds or seen as competing with each other the way it is now, we're getting a situation that we have now, which is that I feel like our democracy is risks almost being unable to address the problem that we're facing right now, because what we're facing right now is a problem that requires multiple stakeholders at the table. I've been doing, as you just said, some are um, a, a lot of interviews this week. And the question I keep asking is what happened in other countries when they faced a crisis like ours? And I use examples of um, Australia and Scotland and other places that have faced questions in the horrible questions in the aftermath of terrible mass shootings like we have uh, now. And, and what I've said is there's no, there's no one there's no one answer. It's not like there's some policy from Australia or like a gun buyback, which is central to Australia intervention. It's not gonna work here. It's not like there's any one policy, but the lesson of other places is people sat around the table and made hard decisions and they compromised. And I think that's the main point is, does our, does our democracy right now allow for those compromises? Maybe that's what's happening in, the, in a Senate committee right now, but I would just say I'm, I'm also, in addition to everything you said, I'm the, I've been the research director for a long time of something called the Safe Tennessee Project, a gun violence prevention group in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And I've seen time and again examples of, of, ex of instances where we, we found, we, we, I remember very vividly about 10 years ago, there was a, a shooting where a, a like nine-year-old kid picked up a gun and shot like a seven-year-old playmate. And, and we were pushing this law that basically was going to make gun owners responsible for having to lock up their weapons before kids could shoot each other. Um, and there was wide agreement at the time among Democratic, um, uh, Republican, Libertarian lawmakers um, until the day before the vote when the NRA swept in and basically threatened anybody who did who crossed the party line with being pri primaried in, in, in a way. And so I think that there are instances where I, I just really feel like there's kind of a common agreement that we could put people around the table right now and come up with a common sense solution that works for people. But our political system really doesn't reward the kind of compromise that we need right now. We have a political system that rewards competition. It's a zero sum winner take all formulation. And so until we can get different voices to the table and really talk about, okay, look, how can you compromise? Uh, where can we meet in the middle? I think we're going to see what we see now, which is that horrible tragedies like these mass shootings lead to hardening of positions, more distance between positions, spike in gun sales, which is what we saw this week. And so in a way, I feel like mass shootings are representative of a system problem and we need to address the system problem because they're, they're symptoms of, 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 our, of, our symptom, of our system right now, um, not rewarding the kind of compromise we need. We're going to come back to that on systems problem, but I want to turn this question and to uh, Professor Blumstein next. Well, I, I think I'm the one on this panel who's not expert on firearms. And my perspective is going to vary a little bit. Uh, I, I agree with uh, uh, Jonathan Metz's last comment that systemic issues are important. But I, I tend to look at this a little differently. I think looking at how, how one frames the issue is extremely important. And so we can frame the issue as one of gun violence. Uh, or we can frame the issue in other ways. Gun violence that we've seen late, lately is not perfectly correlated with, but there are certainly correlations uh, between those who commit crime and mental health issues, for example. Uh, and and um, some, of the, uh, some of the proposals, such as um, the so-called trigger laws or, uh, that we have, I just sat on a dissertation PhD dissertation, where the student found evidence that these uh, trigger laws um, were not effective in reducing homicides. They were effective in reducing suicide. They have been effective. It's a red flag on the trigger law. And so I, I think there's a correlation between uh, mental health issues and the deaths that we've seen. So that tells me that our focus ought to be on uh, violence, lawlessness, concern about access of people who are um, mentally ill um, to uh, weapons, uh, just generally. And, um, and so I think that to me, 
the, the, the means, the end result comes after the analysis. I don't start with gun, uh, gun control or restrictions on guns as the beginning point. I start that, I start the issue is mental health, violence, disrespect for law, and then how do we deal with those in specific contexts? And some restraint on gun ownership, possession, and so forth may be part of a necessary solution. Uh, so that's kind of all point one. Point two is um, I think that from my tradition, uh, before we focus upon, before we seek means that are de deprived uh, people of important rights, whether they are specific constitutional rights or constitutional derived rights, um, is very troubling. Uh, and we have rights of First Amendment. We have people read or hear about things that they hate. We hear that on the internet. They go out and kill people because uh, of some false statement about something that happened in the pizza part or something like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I, I think that uh, there's a burden of uh, restraint on government seeking to legislate in an area that involves what the Supreme Court has called a fundamental interest in the McDonald case, which is self-defense. Self and so that, those are my two points. Let's look at the general concern and to the extent that gun issues are magnifying bad things, then maybe we want to look at things that are unique to gun uh, possession and, and use. And that, but secondly, to my taste, too much of the discussion that focuses upon guns sounds like it's anti-gun rather than pro-civility hmm. or uh, anti-gun. Well, I guess, I guess Professor Blumstein, that's the name of the panel. Um, and so we do talk about civility and we should, and we should bring that in. But the, one of the main reasons we're talking about guns today is because that is the panel um, and to, about the gun debate in America. And I just wanted to make sure that I'm understanding your point correctly, because um, I don't want to lose that. You don't think, we should, you think that we should be talking about violence, but not necessarily only per se talking about gun violence. And we have to, and we will get to this too, especially we had Dr. Metzel with us on the panel here but we should talk about it in relation to mental health. Is that the framing that you're suggesting? I think violence, I understand that that's the topic of the panel and I'm calling it the question whether that should be the topic of public policy. I understand. Public policy discussion. I'm not trying to rename the panel, but I'll, the, way our, the way we think about uh, the issue from a public policy point of view. And to me, the gun violence comes at the end of the discussion rather I see. Than okay, that. thank you for that. And also whose responsibility do you think this is to discuss this, to be to be solving for well, this complex safety, problem? Public safety is, a, is a, a, a prime governmental concern. I think the government has a very strong interest in, in, in uh, coping with public safety. But I think it also has an important issue in uh, making sure that criminals are prosecuted, making sure that disrespect for law is not tolerated and so forth. So th th those are the things that I would look at. And if gun safety or certain things unique to guns uh, are essential to maintaining safety, then I'm open to that solution, but not as a starting point. That's the ending point. Not right. The I get you. And I think we're going to come back to that, too, especially because of your expertise and want to hear more about what laws we should have um, and, and what we should do with those we have in place. And I think that leads us over to you, um, Professor Bjork James, if you could take the first question. Yeah, thank you so much. I think it's it's such a crucial question, and I'm just very happy to be here and happy that this conversation is happening. You know, it's and, and I think it's important to start with this question about what does it mean to live in a democracy with the extent of gun violence that we do? Because, you know, what I'm bringing to this conversation is um, over 15 years of, of expertise in studying the far right movement in the United States, which uh, the Department of Homeland Security has listed as the most um, persistent and lethal threat facing the homeland. It's been responsible for over 75% of extremist related fatalities in the United States. And, you know, it's there's really a trifecta of policy issues that are leading to the massacres that keep happening, inspired by white supremacists. We have um, a 
le legislation on um, hate speech online that's literally decades uh, in the past. Uh, it's not kept keeping up with uh, what is actually happening in terms of online hate and conspiracy theories and their relationship to violence. Uh, we have a uh, intelligence infrastructure that has been hampered by politics to actually address domestic terrorism uh, from far from the far right uh, and really is despite the recognition that the far far right is causing um, the biggest threats to the homeland is the intelligence 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 agencies including you know the FBI and Department of Homeland Security and the DOJ are do not have the resources that they need uh, to actually track and monitor and prevent domestic extremism and then we have the topic of our panel today which is extremely lax gun laws i mean right now someone can have been um tried uh for misdemeanor hate crimes and still go out and buy a gun, despite the fact that we know that many people who commit massacres based on hate uh, begin with misdemeanor hate crimes. And so, you know, the fact that people have a very easy access to guns um, means that there can be a, uh, alongside uh, easy access to disinformation and lack of tracking by our intelligence agencies means that it's a very easy um, like slide from radicalization to execution of massacres. Uh, and we keep seeing, well, we, we will keep seeing this until we actually address these policy issues. So I'm going to turn the question back over to you again as well. Um, in just a couple of words, whose responsibility do you think this is to fix this problem? I'm, I'll go. Back, I'll go with Jonathan. It's all of our responsibility, right? I mean, it's politicians, um, but it's also everyday people to make politicians accountable. I mean, right now we have gun laws that are. I mean, they're really hampered by the NRA in terms of, um, or you know, have, having such a huge influence on um, the Republican Party in particular. Um, so we need to, you know, I think it's politicians, but also everyday people need to make our voices heard about that we don't want to live in a society that with with cascades of violence happening like we want to figure out a way to limit limit these atrocities and you know we can you know there's plenty of examples of other countries that have dealt with this and you know um, it's possible here as well thank you well we hope in, in your remarks today you might be able to also um, point us in some of the countries that you've found to have really good laws and regulations on this that we can look to. Thank you. Um, and Professor Vloker, um, if you could um, take the first question here on whose responsibility is it to, to fix this problem? Sure. And I'll pick up actually right where Sophie left off, because I think it ties back into something Jim was talking about, which is that the framing really matters and thinking about gun violence itself really matters. I mean, and on the issue of, of violence and violent crime, that's where the United States is such an incredible outlier as compared to comparable countries. It's not necessarily in our rates of violent crime, although we worry about that a lot. It's homicides, particularly gun homicides. That are that are the outlier there. And lots of good research about why that might be. I would just note Frank Zimmering and my colleague here, Phil Cook, have done wonderful work on what's called the instrumentality effect. In other words, the gun really matters. Same is true, by the way, and even more so perhaps for, for gun suicides, which account for the majority of gun mm -hmm. deaths. So I think mm -hmm. thinking in mm -hmm. terms of visceral and the physical is, is really a good place to start. Where I would push, I guess, and this goes to the responsibility point though, is that it's a mistake to think just in terms of bullets and bodies, um, that actually the gun issue for, for good and for bad uh, is a lot more than that. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about this some more. And, and Sophie was hitting on this a little bit. And actually you did in your, in your opening comments, Summer, I think by really nicely pointing out that when we think about, for example, who are the victims of school shootings, I think it's a mistake to think just in terms of the number of children as horrific as it is who are killed in schools, which is hundreds over the last 10 years, and to think maybe more broadly in terms of the 300,000 plus who've been, for example, present in schools where a school where a shooting has happened, traumatized by that, those who are traumatized by school shooter drills, like those kinds of considerations I think should matter uh, in this debate as well. And by the way, on the other side, you know, the vast majority of gun owners are law-abiding responsible people who derive, in some cases, great psychic benefit from from gun ownership and from gun use, and that should factor into the calculation as well. So it's it's not it is about violence, but it's not it's it's not just about violence. The other mm -hmm. frame that I would say is really important, and this goes to the responsibility point as well. I agree with Jim that you know thinking about this in terms of rights, I'm, I'm constitutional law scholars so is where my head naturally goes is really really important. This is as the Supreme Court recognized in 2008 a fundamental individual constitutional right, and I think that's crucial. 
I do think though it's a mistake to go too quickly uh, into rights talk um, when mm -hmm. when it's not it's not it's not justified. So you you mentioned the Sandy Hook massacre ten years ago in December of 2012. That led to a concrete and overwhelmingly popular legislative proposal to expand background checks. Ninety percent mm -hmm. of Americans supported this. Seventy five percent of gun owners and NRA members, mm -hmm. and it never made it out of the Senate. And the leading, mm -hmm. the, according to Gallup poll, the major opposition was that people said background checks would violate the Second Amendment. Now that is a position with no support in doctrine. That is not a legal claim. That's just a rhetorical claim about rights. The other thing on that front is I think we shouldn't be too quick to ignore the rights of other people, whether they be other gun owners or non-gun owners, to peaceably assemble, to learn, to worship, to speak without uh, being terrorized by gun owners. There's rights on both sides of this equation. And so to Jonathan's point, when we go too quick to rights versus interests, well, the rights trump because you know rights beat policy, but really there's rights on both sides here. So to your question about responsibility, again, I do think it's everyone. I think we can divide sometimes the, the, the work a little bit. There are some policies I think that are best done or really only effectively done at the federal level. There are lots of other uh, policies that could be done at the state or local level. And so it's important maybe to divide the work and to think in terms of what kinds of policies are we adopting. And the other thing I would add is that there, there's room here. David French has a, has a wonderful piece on this this morning about sort of mm -hmm. changes from within gun culture. Uh, gun culture mm -hmm. has changed dramatically over the decades. Jonathan has written on this and others have as well, such that we're, we're seeing, you know, sort of um, those norms that might have kept a person from openly carrying an AR-15 into a coffee shop kind of erode. And I think that's a problem. And I'm not sure law can fix that. I think that's more of a sort of self-governance social norm story. So that's all, I think, all part of it. Thank you for that. So building on that, I'm going to take, I want, I'd love for you to take this next question and we'll start with you. Um, and that is of the measures being discussed currently in the Senate, mental health funding, school security, violent background checks, and red flag laws, which do you think has the highest chance of success right now? Is there, and is there a misinformation problem that is contributing to this? And are we politicizing this debate at our peril? Uh, whew, lots of good questions in there. Um, I, I would say the, the way I think about it, sort of a, a, a Venn diagram with three circles. And what we need okay. to do is the overlap, which is policies that work as a matter mm -hmm. of policy, policies that are politically feasible, and policies that are constitutional. If you don't okay. have of those, then there's really nothing. That's to helpful. Do, right. And so to, to ask about which ones will be successful, I think it's got to be the ones that satisfy all three conditions. And there's plenty of policies out there that get two, but not all three. They're politically popular and they're effective, but they're unconstitutional. So there's no, there's nothing really to be gained. So of the ones that are out there, um, I, I would say this, I'm glad that we're having a conversation. It seems nationally right now about gun law as a suite of possible interventions and not just a binary or for it or against it. Um, I think different kinds of gun policy are gonna be good at, at, at arresting particular kinds of gun problems. Um, of, the, of the ones that are being debated at the federal level, the two that seem to me most promising are uh, expanded background checks. Uh, okay. the, the background checks went into place in, at the federal level in 1994. More than 3 million people have been denied guns because they failed a background check from a federally licensed dealer, most often because they are felons or fugitives or people with disqualifying mental illness or domestic violence. Uh, uh, um, uh, 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 adjudications, like those are people who federal law decided shouldn't have guns, background checks were a way to keep them away, but the current system only applies to licensed dealers, to expanding it to more dealers, I think is good policy, and again, very, very popular. Red flag laws are very, very interesting, and Jim will know this work um, uh, better. He, as he mentioned, just sat, I think, on a, on a, on a panel of a, a graduate student at Vanderbilt doing good work on this. Um, they've just, they're relatively new. Um, uh, most of them have been adopted in the last five years, but I think there's pretty good evidence so far, and I'd welcome Jim's thoughts on this, that they can address at least the gun suicide problem, which again accounts for the majority of gun deaths. And if we can make an impact on that, I think that would be wonderful. I think the wrong question to ask is, mm -hmm. could any particular gun law have prevented this particular mm -hmm. crime? And I think we too often fall into this, well, mm -hmm. nothing could have been done to stop the shooter at, in Uvalde or wherever else. Although note, he did follow law waiting till he turned 18 to buy the guns that he used in that shooting. Um, I think that's the wrong question. The right, right question is we got mm -hmm. 45,000 45, gun deaths according to the latest, latest CDC data. We could ten percent of that would be forty five hundred lives saved, and that would be extraordinary. Well, let me just say about Phil. Please, Phil Cook. Phil's like he and I go back a long way, and I know his work is also on things like uh, prohibition uh, and uh, striking claim there, which apparently is right, is that the evidence showed that cirrhosis of the liver, death by cirrhosis, went down during prohibition. 
Um, and so if you only look at health from the very narrow point of view of how many people died from cirrhosis of the liver, which is brought on by drinking, excess drinking, then prohibition was a great success. But then that kind of misses the point, it seems to me, the broader point of whether that ultimately is the right strategy or a good strategy. And that's why I say gun, gun issues and controlling of gun issues have to come at the end of the conversation. Here we have a series of problems. How can we address those problems? Some restrictions on gun ownership, whatever may be a part of the mix. Um, I, I, I certainly don't agree with uh, kind of the Second Amendment advocate to say that there is no role for regulation. I think there can be, but I think that, that we can't disrespect that right either because there are other values involved, including mental health. And I think, and I'm going to risk being a little uncivil here with Sophie, is that I think starting off and saying, well, this is a right wing problem and how do we step out the right wing? And they're the, 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 the evil people here. And my ears closed when I heard her, frankly, is that she turned me off tremendously with that rhetoric and anything she would be for, I would be against. So, I mean, that's uh, an easy conversation. That's not a way to start the conversation is all I'm saying. Um, Professor Bjork, James, you'd like to respond? Yeah, I mean, I think the thing is, is that there's an organized, uh, there's the, there, there's an organized white nationalist movement and an organized anti-governmental movement that their goal is to overthrow the United States government, right? I'm not talking about every Republican. I'm not ever talking about everyone who considers them to be on the right, right? But this is like a part of um, like the radical right. There's a very, very established, elaborate, widespread movement whose goal is to actually overthrow the US government, either because of uh, just general anti-governmental sentiment or because of uh, racism and anti-Semitism. Uh, and I mean, I'm not making, you know, this isn't, I'm not here as a, you know, like radical leftist having a political agenda. I'm here as a scholar who has studied this movement, who has seen it inspire widespread act of, acts of violence. And who knows that, all of our uh, intelligence agencies describe this movement as posing the biggest threat to US citizens from extremism, right? And so I think what, I think it's important what you're bringing up in terms of not wanting to hear this, because I think for white nationalists, they, they want, they want to, uh, they, they want to um, be considered as part of a conservative movement. Right, and that 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 benefits them to be seen as part of a broader conservative movement because then the conservative movement, so mainstream Republicans, even far right Republicans, will uh, you know support policies and legislation that also supports white nationalism. Um, so I think what when when I talk, and when I talk about um, you know far right terrorism, I'm not talking about Republicans. Like Republicans should be. <laughs> Should should be coming out and being very clear that they are not supportive of these anti-governmental movements like the Boogaloo Boys, and they're not supportive of explicit white nationalism because those movements actually want to overthrow U.S. democracy, right? And I think what's happened time and again is that uh, conservative um, conservative legislators um, will also kind of hear criticisms about the radical right and say, oh, I think they're talking about me. And so I'm not going to actually pass legislation um, to uh, try to prevent violence from the radical right when, you know, we I think there should we should be seeing a difference between, you know, people who are conservative, you know, but also um, supportive of the US state, right, is supportive of like kind of playing within the rules of the US state in terms of engaging in politics and people who actually want to overthrow the US government, right? And impose an um, overthrow democracy and impose an autocracy. Um, and when those people have, you know, widespread access to guns, it is causing, it causes violence. And it and, it, and we've, we've, we've all seen that. And, you know, as I mentioned, it's like none other than the Department of Homeland Security has labeled this movement the most persistent and lethal threat facing the homeland. Right. 
Um, I, I do see your hand up, Professor Blumstein. We will come back to you, but I want to give Dr. Metzl a chance as the psychiatrist on the panel to come in and talk about mental health because it's, it's come up several times now, and you've mentioned that it's the place we should start when we're having this debate. So Dr. Metzl, if you could please take this question. Well, so many important things. I mean, I was just thinking as everybody is talking, I was thinking two things. One is that an hour is not going to be long enough for this conversation. And so we should have like 75 of these conversations. We'll do series. So we'll do a series. Yeah, you just volunteered yourself for a series. I love it. I love it. I also want to congratulate my dad, who after texting me for like the last 20 minutes, finally figured out how to log on to the webinar. So my dad is one of the 503 uh, participants here. Um, but um, but I, I wanted to say just a few things about what's going on before uh, what we're floating around here before before I do talk about mental health, because I think it's important. I mean, I do think that even in this conversation, we're, we're, we're kind of illustrating um, the different frameworks and paradigms that, that people bring to this issue, right? And I, I certainly would agree with Jim um, I, I, that I think we need to think really hard about what are the implications of the of the solutions we propose to a, a really complex problem. I mean, I'm, I'm a card-carrying member of the gun violence prevention, GVP movement. And I would also say I personally have concerns about, for example, what we're calling red flag laws here, um, not so much because of constitutionality, but because early history shows who's, when you say like, let's surveil people who look dangerous and predict crime before, who do you think gets surveilled by something like that? Um, early studies in Washington and other places show that like black Americans get dinged 10 times more than anybody else. Um, Background checks, again, not a panacea in this regard, um, because background checks, when you buy a gun, it's basically who's got a history of incarceration or arrest, who do you think is going to get dinged by that? And so on one hand, I don't think we have a perfect solution to these issues. And I think race and racism are certainly an important point that I think that the, the gun, I'll just call it the gun control side for shorthand, needs to think much more seriously about. Um, and we, we haven't done that. Um, and it's in, and, and at the same time, um, I think it's important to push back on some of the, just the constitutionality questions here, just given the history of the way that the Second Amendment has been interpreted by the Supreme Court. I could go into great detail um, about the Heller decision, but basically the Heller decision um, in 2008 made all kinds of provisos, basically saying that the gun, right to own and carry guns in public mainly um, is not universal, that that quote unquote felons and persons with mental illness, that the role of government is to is to regulate that, is to con consider who has the right to carry a gun in public. Now, I could talk for an hour or more about how that came to be, the, you know, the 1980s era new and undiscovered evidence that the right of carrying guns um, that um, all of a sudden applied to individuals, not to um, militaries. That, 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 that was, that's a pretty recent interpretation of the Second Amendment. Um, but I would say that what, what's at risk and what Sophie, I think, was referencing is these ideas of a kind of constitutional carry, um, this idea that basically anybody can own and carry a gun without any kind of government intervention. I think, I think that's really the danger now, is that the Heller decision in 2008 laid out provisos that, that balance Second Amendment rights with public safety. And I really think that's what's up for grabs right now in, with respect, our home state of Tennessee, where we're overturning any kind of regulation. And I think the implication of that is, is pretty powerful. Now, in terms of mental illness and mental health, um, I would just say, I certainly think that if you look at high profile mass shooters, I would of course agree that there are long and troubled histories of mental illness treatment, mental symptoms, things like that uh, for many of these high profile mass shootings. There was a great piece um, that I helped with in the Boston Globe last week that looked at the actual psychological and psychiatric histories of mass shooters. And what they found was that there were tons of other factors in psychology, but also in the world psychologically um, much more much more attributed to characterological factors like um, aggrieved nature, grievance, resentment, racism, misogyny, things that were not in any way linked to a mental illness diagnosis, but instead to a lifelong characterological issue. Um, and also a bunch of other issues like access to firearms in the state where you live, past history of violence, history of partner violence, substance abuse. So my concern with the mental illness issue, first of all, is that it's cherry picked a among the hundreds of other factors that go just into high profile mass shootings, let alone the 44,000 other 
gun deaths we have in this country that aren't linked to mass shootings. Um, and so it feels very cherry picked in the way that, for example, when Gover Governor Abbott says we need to address mental illness as if a psychiatrist could predict gun gun death, that ain't, that ain't happening again because there are many, many other factors that are involved in this. And then also going back to what Joseph was saying before, the, the, the mental illness that's not talked about in the debate is the mental illness we're creating by thinking that you can get shot every time you go, you step out, outside, uh, outside your, your house in a way. And so we're creating a national PTSD right now um, by our inability to ad address this issue. And so for those reasons, um, you know, I, I have a lot of writing on this, but I, I certainly push back on the way that mental illness is used as a, as a, a kind of red herring in a way to, to distract from real, real conversations. So building on that, um, and as you've mentioned, and as others on our panel have mentioned a couple of times now, mass shootings account for less than 2% of gun deaths um, in the United States, but they grab much more attention in the public and in the media. And the majority of death of gun deaths stem from uh, suicides and almost half are single victim homicides. Um, so how do we solve for the underlying issue here, um, which by this data seems to be violent crime and suicide, which keeps coming up here. Um, and should we complexify the issue to focus on gun safety instead of gun control, which I know that you, Professor Blumstein, also mentioned in your opening remarks in the first question. Is this more of an issue about public safety than it is about gun control? We'll start with you, yes. I would like for everybody to take, to take that question. I, again, I, I think that that 2% number is an interesting number, I think that the, the broad question is how, how I think uh, Jonathan's really on the right track here, is how do we address the problem? And while I don't insist on root causes, sometimes things are so bad that you have to deal with symptoms. Uh, if you can understand the etiology, uh, that is really helpful. If there is something short term, it's a problem, which is what Kofi was suggesting. Uh, I'm not against dealing with the short-term problem either, but characterizing this as a right-wing conspiracy is so unhelpful because that is really not what the issue is that we're dealing with. Uh, look at uh, going back to cases that were new when I was in law school, a case called the United States versus Rebel, that Joe Joseph will remember. And that's where the communists could work at defense plants. And the Supreme Court said, well, that's not enough of an issue. You have to go and drill down to the individuals, how influential they are. In other words, you have to look at some imminence and clear and present danger and so forth. And, and just the fact that, that a bunch of nuts are having rallies and say, down with America, uh, I, I, mean, I would be glad to condemn that as well. But to frame the gun issue and the safety issue as focusing upon that is, I think, missing the broader point. I would include uh, things like, where's the outrage when a DA doesn't prosecute a driver of a car who targets a woman and, a, and her child? I mean, this is a horrible thing that's going on. For, for, fortunately, they've survived. There should be uniform outrage about something like that. There should be clamors for having uh, uh, isolation of a person like that. And uh, if there is going to be rehabilitation after a period of isolation, I need mean, capacitation. So I, mean, I think there are, uh, there are lots of issues here that can culminate in restrictions on firearms. And I'm, as I said, I'm open to that at the end of the day as a result. But I want to hear more about, not so much about you know, what, what the Klan is doing or some right-wing nut group is doing uh, that I would be glad to condemn, which I think is not gonna happen. I mean, we had Oklahoma City occur, we're still standing as a country. Uh, so, I, so I mean, I think uh, it, there's much more danger in seeing non-response by mainstream policy officials and non-prosecution by uh, prosecutors of people like that young man who was apparently a recidivist who was targeting a mother and her kids and and things going on in portland and seattle all that we know about we don't excuse those activities because that breeds a culture 
with disrespect for law. So I wanted to see a balanced approach and targeting one particular group. Uh, there's going to be no way in this country that we're going to have gun control against the right wing and no gun control against Antifa. That's just not going to happen. I'm sorry. Uh, it's not consistent with the First Amendment. And the rhetoric along those lines calls into question the seriousness of people who advocate those positions. That's why I said when I heard Sophie say what he had to say, uh, I'm looking at this more from the point of view of advocacy. I, I think it's not appropriate or smart advocacy to take that position. Uh, Professor Bjork, James, would you like to respond? And also to address the question too. Right. Um, yeah. And I, I, you know, I'm bringing up uh, the dangers that stem from domestic extremism because that's the area of my research. Uh, you know, it's part. It's part of the question of, of gun reform, but certainly not all. And I just want to clarify that my comments were not saying we should only certain people with like only certain political perspectives should experience gun control. Uh, I was making the point that given the fact that we have both extremely um, lax gun, gun control rules, meaning that most people, almost any, anyone who's not a felon can go get a gun if they want to, that uh, alongside a robust domestic extremist movement, uh, it's a recipe for, uh, for danger and it does put us all at risk. And again, this is from the evidence that stems from you know, um, all of our intelligence agencies. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that it would be very problematic for anyone to say that, you know, there's like, it should be a, you know, um, political orientation test, uh, you know, to uh, if someone is to get a gun, but uh, it's more of a recognition that uh, very clearly uh, our uh, lax gun control laws are potentially putting our democracy at risk. And, that's because there's there are social movements that are you know working working to try to subvert U.S. democracy, um, and so I, I I think the to go back to the the question you know it is a really important question that you know the um, these you know massacres that either political politically motivated um, or you know inspired by hate receive a tremendous amount of attention uh, and that is because terrorism is a very specific kind of crime right that it isn't just about um, there's something about the randomness and there's something about the it's uh, targeting a specific group of people um, and so that you know causes um, widespread anxiety uh, and I think so I think it's, I, but, but I think I guess to go back to the question, part of it is that, you know, I think we need more, just more um, information about gun, gun violence, you know, and that I feel like there's a lot of ignorance mm -hmm. about the extent of gun violence, about the manifestations of it, uh, and, you know, a widespread belief that more gun, you know, more guns equals more safety when all evidence points to the opposite. Thank you. I want to turn to, I want to give actually Professor Blocker, I see you have a point on this too. I want to turn to you and then we'll go to the Q&A. Well, just, just to quickly answer your question, since it was a question of whether Thank it's you. to complexify. Yeah, and as a, as a, as a professor, that the answer is always yes. Like I always want to complexify everything, um, uh, at least to break out different issues. So building on what Sophie just said, which I think is exactly right. I mean, mass shootings and other gun related events that don't even result in deaths, I think can have knock on effects above and beyond what might show up in emergency rooms. So when armed individuals stormed the Michigan legislature two summers ago, right. two summers ago and forced its yeah. early closure, they were violating no gun laws. They were not have been allowed right. at this point, they would not have been allowed to carry posters into the legislature, that was forbidden, but AR-15s were fine, right? Like that, that to me is, it catches a harm and a trauma in a way that mass shootings can, um, uh, uh, can do. Now, I think the important thing is those kinds of events might lead us to think about forms of regulation. And this is where I think we're all united in thinking, well, the 
tricky thing is focus on the regulations that matter and that work. And if you focus on just the kind of weapon that happened to be used in that kind of a crime, well, then you might focus on what are often called assault weapons, not understanding that those are very rarely used in, uh, uh, in, in gun crimes, that handguns drive the vast majority of gun deaths, right? So complexify in, uh, in that sense. I think it might also hopefully help us get through some of the partisan gap, which um, Sophie and, and Jim are talking about sort of maybe in different ways there. But to Sophie's, um, I'll put words in Sophie's mouth here, there actually is a left-right division here. Um, and it's a huge one and a growing one. The partisan gap between Republicans and Democrats on is it more important to protect gun rights or to regulate guns was 20 points 30 mm. years ago, which is big. It's 60 points now. It's bigger wow. than abortion or any other issue. This is a almost entirely partisan divide. And so we got to mm. recognize that and figure out how to get around it. My, my own experience has been it helps to be specific. There's not a partisan gap on things like universal background checks, a tiny one. There's not a big partisan gap on things like extreme risk protection orders, also known as red flag laws. Of course, the details really matter, but I think that that that's important. And for those who support regulation, I think it's really important to know what we're talking about. Um, I think sometimes you'll see people in public discourse say, we got to get rid of the semi-automatic weapons. A semi-automatic weapon is just one that shoots one bullet each pull of the trigger. Usually when people say that, they mean automatic weapons, which you pull down mm -hmm. the trigger and keep shooting bullets. So know what you're talking about if you're supporting regulation and Last thing to Jonathan's point, the question of race and enforcement is so crucial. And I think both sides have underappreciated over the years. I think Jonathan's point is incredibly well taken. We know who will bear the brunt of law enforcement if there are more gun laws. We know we can see it out there today. It's gonna to be communities of color and especially disproportionately young black men. On the other hand, the failure to enforce could exacerbate the already extraordinary disparities about who dies from gun violence. Young black men, 15 to 34, about 2% of the US population, about 38% of gun homicides. It's just an extraordinary number that keeps growing. So we've got this kind of Scylla and Charybdis to sort of steer through here in terms of finding, finding the right solutions. I, well, like on, yeah, go, well. I have a comment in response to Sophie's points before. Uh, two, two points. One of, the, one of the most striking parts to me, and I think it's the McDonald case, which is the one that said that the Second Amendment applies to the states and it, Second Amendment values are fundamental. Uh, in discussing fundamentality, I was totally prepared uh, reading the case for the first time to understand that protection against um, vigilante groups, the Klan and other groups, was part of why guns were fundamental. But then you read another, another part of the history that the Supreme Court wrote, and that is possession of guns not only against the Klan and militia and uh, vigilantes, but against government. That was part of this, is that our tradition of guns is also has this notion of defending oneself against oppression by government. And that was totally foreign to me, but that's part of the Second Amendment tradition. It's not just to protect yourself against gangs and against the Klan, but against the Thank you, Professor Blumstein. Okay. I, I, I well, we uh, we can we can go back to that in your closing remarks because we do we are coming up on on the on the end here, and we have six remaining minutes, and I want to make sure that we get to one of the questions from the audience, and that we then turn to closing remarks. Um, so definitely hold that thought. Um, and the question here, we'll start with you, Dr. Metzl, um, which builds actually on what Professor Bloker was saying, and it's a question from Paul in the audience, and that is, what is the bipartisan law? or action that is most likely to reduce gun violence in the United States? I, did, I don't love that. We, I mean, I understand why we have these conversations after mass shootings. It's when people are paying attention. It's when the stakes of sure. stakes are so high and, and urgent. Um, but if you look at it, like mass shootings are incredibly polarizing in a way. People, it's like a Rorschach test, exactly what, uh, what we were just hearing. People see gun violence and say, uh, mass shootings and say, oh, we need gun reform. Or, right. we, or, or people say, man, there are scary people out there and I better have a gun to arm myself and my family. And so in a way, I think it's important always to remember at times like this, that mass shootings, as horrific as they are, we have well more than 45,000 um, gun deaths a year in this country, which is the most recent CDC number. Um, and maybe 700, 1,000 are from mass shootings with at least 44,000 gun deaths um, by other means, uh, as, some are, as you were saying before. And I think the important point is mass shootings seem impossible because they are, to quote Jeff Swanson, um, incredibly unpredictable, rare acts of violence. Um, but everyday gun death is not 
unpredictable, right? Every gun vet death, I can give you a whole list of, it happens in social networks. It happens with people who have had past histories of violence. Alcohol is very often involved. Your state gun law and the state gun law of the state next to you matters. I mean, there's a huge list. So everyday gun violence is incredibly, incredibly predictable. And I think if we focused on like, how can we fo- how can we stop everyday gun death as opposed to having the conversation which is urgent and heartfelt, but also uh, to me, not effective. How can we stop the next mass shooting? We've already kind of lost the issue. And then I'll just say, even though I know it's off the political table, but I can't help but add that um, people, um, 21 to 18, God love them, my students who are watching now, um, they, they, they're maybe, what, 16% of the population between under 25 to 14, but it's over 40% of the shootings and victims. And so I think age just now has become part of the conversation because of these things. And so I do think that the age at which people can buy and carry guns is an important factor um, to consider as well as one of these other factors about if we addressed kind of the everydayness of gun, gun trauma then um, then we I certainly think we could cut our gun deaths in half in this country. Thank you for that. And with our remaining time, I'd like for everyone in um, 30 seconds um, to, uh, to, let's see, um, to, to 50 seconds <laughs> to um, tell us to go back to the first question, your first answer to the first question, actually. And that's what I think is on the minds of a lot of people in the audience today. And that's your point, Dr. Metzl, that you just made. What can people do? at home. What do you suggest that they do about this? Because everyday Americans are concerned and wanna be a part of the solution and we know this. So how can everyday Americans be a part of the solution? I'll start with you, Professor Bloker. Sure, um, and I'll do my 50 seconds if I can. This is to echo something I said earlier, we shouldn't always just look to governmental solutions here. Not everything's gonna come out of law. Um, you know, Everybody who's been a shooter or has been a victim of a shooting had a family and had friends and maybe somewhere along the line, somebody had a chance to intervene. So check on the people around you. Um, you know, that's the, that's the easiest place to start. It doesn't require any kind of governmental intervention to just ask people, how are they doing? Um, you know, as, uh, as Jonathan said, mental illness as a whole is very poor proxy for a person being violent um, with a gun or not. Um, but if you're close to somebody, you might know. Um, as far mm-hmm. as like what can happen politically, uh, in my last 15 seconds, I'll give you one federal, one state, one local, federal level, let's expanded background checks, state level, well-written extreme risk protection orders, local level, continue to have locational restrictions on where people can take guns, like for example, into bars or places where alcohol is served. Thank you. Professor Bjork James. Yeah, thanks so much. I mean, I I agree that it's all about starting at the very local level, you know, um, in terms of, uh, you know, radicalization into far right extremism. If you're um, around you, white, white youth, then check in on them and where they're spending time online. Um, that's really important. Having more conversations about, uh, you know, the facts about, about guns and their relationship to violence. Uh, and then, you know, a couple of, uh, of um, policies that are being debated. There's one, the Disarm Hate Act, which would um, prevent people who've had misdemeanor, been convicted of misdemeanor hate crimes from um, being able to access uh, firearms. And then also the um, Congress is now debating the Domestic Terrorism Prevention Act, um, which would uh, share, uh, you know, direct more resources to actually preventing domestic terrorism. Thank you, Dr. Metzl. Um, well, I, I love this conversation, um, and, I, and, and again, I think these are the kind of conversations we have to be having. Um, we're, we're representing a, a, a wide array of opinions, and I think we're coming to some important points. I mean, we could just take all the papers on Jim's desk and stick them in my refrigerator. You know, we can, you know, we could we can come to some common solutions here in a way. Um, I, I would say that I, I wholly agree with this binary of like gun owner bad, um, gun safety good, or something like that. We have to fight back against these particular binaries. Um, And so I I certainly think that um, having kind of these kind of conversations is super, super important. And then thinking about how that can play out in terms of actual law. I mean, I have to go right now because I'm going on ABC News and they just sent me a note and it said, should we bar guns to the mentally ill? Like, so the popular conversation right now, which I keep saying, no, it's more complicated, but just the popular discourse pushes us into these simplistic binaries that think we all hate each other and that, and that there's some kind of s- solution that, that is not as nuanced as what we've been talking about here. Thank you. And Professor Blumstein. 
I think that the, to me, the broad topic is lawlessness. Okay. Is the subspecies of lawlessness. And so I think that you know, part of the question, and this goes back to when I was in law school, there was a book about the honest politician's guide, guide to, to crime. Uh, and I think that uh, to, to be as a society, to be very strong, that lawlessness is not acceptable, uh, that they, people should be prosecuted. Uh, if necessary, incapacitated if they are done to others, including people who shoot people, they, they should be incapacitated. And the second point is I remember, and I have to say, uh, with respect to uh, Professor Brooke Red Game, uh, she cites uh, intelligence agencies. And I have to remember the first year law student, my car law class taught by Robert Bork. I raised my hand as a young student in a seminar. And I said, but Oliver Wendell Holmes said something. And I thought I'd have checkmate. And Bork looked back at me and said, Mr. Blumstein, just because you cite Oliver Wendell Holmes, don't think that that's checkmate. So citing a particular source is not checkmate. Uh, sorry, it's how you frame the question and how you think about the approach to that set of issues. So it's nice to have a data point what the intelligence agencies say, but that's not the end of the conversation. And it doesn't end the analysis. Well, Professor Blumstein, I want I want to give Professor Bjork James a chance to respond to that since you've you've specifically pointed out her comment. So we'll we'll go to Professor Bjork James and then I, I will I will wrap us up. Yeah, I mean, I it's you know I I I come from a family of hunters. Like I grew up shooting guns. Like I don't I I I think that it's really important to you know again not frame this as a you know the like kind of dichotomy. And I think the, uh, in terms of like, you know, gun owners are bad. Um, but I also think we need to be very, very <laughs> clear about the evidence. I mean, I'm someone who gets called on after every mass shooting inspired by white nationalism um, to kind of explain to the media, like what is going on. And there's a huge lack of, in of information about the extent of this movement, um, the violence that it's caused. And you know that violence that extends far beyond just the people who are actually murdered or maimed, but are also afraid. Uh, and you know, I think it's really important for us to, to recognize that that movement exists and to be very clear that it's not, it's, 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 a, it's a distinct movement um, that is really mobilizing to, um, you know, support anti-Semitism and racism. And that is, you know, and I think that there needs to be more people in the conservative movement too, to kind of, to recognize that that, that threat is happening and that it's not, and that they're distinct from conservative, um, you know, conser people with conservative political views uh, who actually support democracy, right? I think this there's anti-democratic movements that are trying to overthrow the government that are inspiring violence. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately, because they have widespread access to guns are, uh, con will continue to cause violence. Thank you. And I'd like to thank everyone again for joining us today for what is not an easy or a pleasant topic but an important one nonetheless. I'd also like to express our deep gratitude to our panelists for bringing their expertise and research to this conversation today. Thanks to the four of you, Dr. Metzl just left us, and I think we will all leave here today with a deeper understanding of this complex problem and a rocky but viable path forward in addressing it. Today's conversation will be available to rewatch at vanderbilt.edu slash unity, and you can subscribe to the project's newsletter and follow us on Twitter at Vandy Unity to keep up with future events and discussions related to unity and American democracy. There are clearly many facets to this issue, and Vanderbilt University will continue this discussion later in the future. We hope you will join us for future events. Thank you, and again, take care.